uh, host organization for, for this event. And uh, we are um, a China-based environmental issue focused uh, and a charitable, charitable foundation. Most of our work is about building sustainable urban communities in China through engaging local residents to participate in actions such as waste segregation, composting and community gardening and so on. So food is such an important part of our life. With families, friends and community, we enjoy our food every day. But FAO reports that 70% of all food available to uh, consu uh, consumers end up becoming food waste. And the total emission, if counted as a, comp as a country, would rank the third largest emitter uh, from the food waste. So uh, contributing significantly to our society, uh, environmental problems, and uh, climate change challenges. But I, sometimes I think the food waste issue has not got enough attention on the climate change discussion arena as it should deserve. So I'm glad today that we gather together in the COP28 to discuss about it, to tackle food waste problems. Uh, we need to think and act from the perspective of policy, regulations, business, and most importantly, from people's mindset and their behavior. And many of the changes need to be looked at from the community perspective and, and because that's where we ha inherit the way we do things uh, from our community. So today, we are very pleased to have six distinguished panelists with us today uh, to talk about this issue and share their insights and cases. So please let me, uh, let, uh, well, uh, allow me to introduce them to you uh, with no particular order as order always important in my culture. Uh, first one is Shen Gen Fan, Chair, Professor, and a Dean of Academy of Global Food Economics and Policy, AGFEP, at China Agricultural University. And the second speaker is uh, uh, Yvette Cabrera, Director of Food Waste of, Net of uh, Natural Resource Defense Council. Sebastian Manden, Chair of the Waste and Resources Action Program, or known as RAP. Lisa Moon, President and CEO of the Global Food Banking Network, GFN. And also uh, Sahil Parak, Program Lead of uh, Council on Energy, Environment and Water, uh, CEW. Last but not least, uh, Bei Bei Chan, uh, Vice Secretary General of Guangdong Low Carbon Development and Promotion Association, uh, which is the, the other organizer of this, to this event. So uh, please give us our uh, panelists a round of a warm applause. <laughs> We're going to have a presentation session followed by a panel discussion. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, you can write down the note and pass to me. I will give it to the, our panelists. So with a, without further ado, please welcome our first speaker, Pre, uh, uh, Professor Fan Chengken. Fan Chengken. Professor Fan is the leading uh, researcher in China uh, in terms of uh, agri-food uh, uh, area, and uh, he has a close uh, partnership with uh, Banker Foundation. Please welcome Professor Fan. Well, good afternoon, everybody. So it's a really honor to speak first. So what I will speak is the food waste and loss in China actions. So I hope the PowerPoint will be up maybe over, over here. I'll wait for a little after. Yes, OK. Uh, could I have the kids? Yeah, as moderator mentioned, the food loss and the waste is a huge problem. So we waste one third of our food in China, probably a similar amount. In the meantime, it also contributed to a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So around probably nine or eight to 10% of the global uh, total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so,
Oh, okay, in China, I wanted to give you a bit more information about China. Um, I think the problem, the challenge in China is similar to global network. So more than 350, around 350 million tons of food is lost or wasted. So if you calculate the percentage, that accounts for probably 30 to 40 percent of the total food. So China is producing about um, let's say 700 million tons of food by itself. But in the meantime, China also imports 150 million to 200 million tons. So you can calculate, calculate as a percentage. It is a pretty significant amount. Then if you look at uh, uh, the dis disaggregation of the food loss and waste around the food value chain. So even during production stage of, of pre-farm gate, China already lost quite a bit of food. So about 24%. So many issues, for example, because of diseases, climate change, and uh, um, the different varieties. So even before harvest, 25, 24% of food is already lost. And obviously after the uh, harvesting, the whole value chain, um, the loss is also very significant. For example, account for 45%, so big amount. And um, household waste within the household is smaller than other countries, but we needed to, to connect more evidence whether that's the case. It seems to me 5% uh, waste in, in the total uh, household consumption is a bit small. Now, China actually is one of the first countries that introduced legislation or law on food waste for not. In fact, in, in uh, April 2021, so China National Congress uh, approved a new legislation against food waste and a loss. So you will see that it asks for different countries, different levels of countries to take actions to develop policy technology to reduce food waste and loss. For example, uh, it, it has tasked the, um, the development and reform commissions to introduce certain technologies and policies to make sure that all the ministries will develop their own policies technologies to reduce food waste loss. For example, Ministry of Commerce, um, let's say Ministry of Environment, obviously, Market Supervision Administration, and the National Grain and the Material Reserve Bureau. So all these ministries have been tasked by the national government to reduce food waste and loss. Now, um, then in October 2021, only after six months, China began to launch uh, a program or action. So it's not just a policy, not just legislation, but more important is action, action programs. So again, it crosses different ministries, production side, effic efficient use of seeds, uh, reduce harvest losses, the storage, improve the storage, the transportation, processing, particularly processing, processing not only just as physical waste, but also most more important is the um, removing some of the more nutri nutritious, healthy foods from the grains through over-processing. For example, whole grains, brown rice, whole wheat, um, now does not exist in China. So then the consumption side, you know, different regulations, uh, different promotions, public affairs to really reduce the food waste from the consumption side. Now, uh, the this, this specification of green food delivery management is quite important to make sure that um, the, not only production consumption, but also delivery part. So it strengthens messaging to consumers about portion appropriate ordering. So when the consumers order food, either in restaurant or online, and they are encouraged to take the proper uh, proportion. And promote smaller portion size dishes. You know, not just the, well, if you go to a restaurant, it really matters whether you will use a small plate or a big plate. You know, I used to work for International Food Policy Research Institute based in Washington. We found that if the small plates are used, and usually the, the consumers take less food or waste less food. Now, but also provincial government, you know, central government, different ministries, commissions begin to introduce policy regulations. But equally important is the provincial government, even the county level government. Equally important, they take measures, they introduce legislation. So, for example, Department of Edu Provincial Department of Education begin to use advocacy, education, 
an action plan for reducing school catering waste, the school catering waste. And de Department of Housing and Urban Consumer Development, uh, kitchen waste reduction and uh, utilization. And Department of Commerce, reduce, reduce food waste in the dining and the consumption process. So this is at the provincial level, by the way. Market regulations, grain, you know, similarly, provincial grain, material reserves, uh, then provincial administration, uh, particularly general government administration to reduce the food waste in government canteens. So the provincial government really take that on very seriously. So just to give you one example in Sichuan province. So they really try to connect the information on how much you waste in your, let's say in your restaurant or in your garbage can. They charge you based on how much you waste. So, um, so for example, uh, if you waste, if you waste is less than five kg per day, then you will be charged three yuan. However, if you waste 30 kg per day, then you will be charged 20 yuan per day. So based on the amount of food you waste, you dump into your garbage can. That's in Sichuan province. I heard that in many other provinces, they also use a similar policy, similar, similar, similar uh, actions. Then, well, it's not just uh, the, the policy, but also they go there to, to, to inspect whether actually, whether the actual actions have really been taken. So, for example, uh, in Sichuan province, you know, more than 300,000 inspections have been done. And then, obviously, the assessment and the disclosure system for anti-food waste worked effectively in government canteens, because the government in China owns a lot of restaurants canteens. And how can we make sure that the food is not wasted in this government? by assessing their performance. The action from the organization and the private sector, in addition to the government, government policies, regulation, uh, public campaigns, equally importantly, the private sector uh, actions. So for example, uh, in Sichuan province, uh, some, some sort of NGOs initiated stock food waste initiatives. And uh, so many uh, members, whether online, offline, uh, attended that platform. Clean plate and offering smaller portion sizes, promoting so called N1 plus ordering model. So, and lots of new innovations. I think it's very important that the private sector really takes this on. I, um, I often give lectures to the retailing uh, industry association in China. I always try to promote healthy, nutritious diets, but in the meantime, reducing food waste loss. Some of the retail chains, Walmart, uh, Carrefour, and uh, even some of the Chinese. Uh, Mount New and, and beyond. Then I'm a researcher. I'm also monitoring the, how much research that has been done on food waste loss. So for example, before, two, before 2020, there were few studies on food waste loss. But right after the next nation was introduced, you see the big jump of the studies on food waste and loss. So this is very good news because we need the data, we need the information, we need research-based evidence. And my university, I mean, if you want to change the whole world, you must start from yourself. So I started from myself. I don't waste food. My family does not waste food. But that's not, big, that's not good enough. My research institute, so I set up a research academy called Academy of Global Food Economics and Policy. So funded by Wanker Foundation, we're doing research on students' cafeteria or universal canteens. The first finding is the universal canteen wastes so much food. We know how much they, they wasted. We can, we, can, we can wait, we can measure how much disposal they had from the restaurant. So that's number one finding. Second, the students' behavior in wasting food is very different. Girls, boys are very different. Rural, they're, they're, you know, their they're birthplace, whether it's rural areas, urban areas, they're all very different. So we, find, we try to analyze sources of or the reasons of wasting food among students. It's not only my university, but also Tsinghua, Beijing, Beijing University, many others. So we can compare. So it's truly, truly something to find that personally wasting a lot of food is, is, is a phenomenon. Second, if we do some intervention, interventions, giving them knowledge information or behavior, they can change quite a bit. My university introduced a system to charge students based on the weight of the food. 
they buy. And also based on the kind of food they buy. Meat is different from vegetable. It's from, different from grain. So my university charged a student based on that. And we say immediately, nobody wastes the food just by simply introducing that food. So I think we need action from different players. So for example, the governments I have already mentioned, the parliament members, Congress members, the government contains universities, private sector, NGOs. I think most important, as the moderator said, ourselves. Let's start from today. Let's not waste food. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Fan. I think uh, you just gave a very good example of, uh, regarding the student canteen because I, 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 I know that in my kids' school, they give each kid the same amount of food because that's easy to distribute, but uh, you know, turn out a lot of waste because people eat different amount. Thank you very much. Uh, our second speaker is Lisa Moon. Uh, she is the CEO and the president of GFN, and under her leadership, the network now serves nearly 32 million people in 50 countries. Very impressive. Uh, Lisa, this floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure, that's fine. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for having me and for convening this session on such an important topic. And Dr. Fawn, thank you for those introductory comments. In uh, the interest of full disclosure, Dr. Fawn is also on our board of directors, so he can correct anything I might say after my presentation or during. <laughs> so no, um, I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, and um, the Global Food Banking Network, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do, but then I want to talk about um, a very specific project that we're working on to better quantify the impact that food banks are having on climate change, and in particular on methane mitigation. So the first thing is, just as a big global picture, we know that right now there's a significant amount of people facing chronic undernourishment, about uh, around anywhere between 621 to 733 million people are facing chronic undernourishment, struggling daily to access enough food. Um, but on top of that, we have 2.3 billion people facing food insecurity and more than 3 billion people that are not able to afford a nutritious meal. Um, and of course, the contrast to all of this, um, as it's already been stated, is that we are losing or wasting a third of all food produced for human consumption. So this excludes food produced for animal feed and for biofuels. Um, so it's a very significant gap in a food system that is already um, not as sustainable, accessible, or as equitable as it could be. Um, and not only does the food loss and waste produce a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions, it's estimated to be 8 to 10 percent, a lot of those emissions are coming from methane. Um, and as everyone here may recall, about two years ago, there was a very significant push at COP to try to do methane mitigation. Um, and what we're specifically looking at is the 18 percent of um, uh, human-caused methane emissions that are really focused on organic waste and waste um, coming from landfills. And a lot of that is food. Um, and so the, the organization that I lead really sees the food banking model, which I'll talk a bit about, as one solution to not only addressing short-term food and access, but also to, um, as a pathway to reduce methane emissions and CO2 emissions more broadly. So what is a food bank? Um, a food bank is a community-based organization. It's a grassroots initiative, and what it does is it works with producers across the supply chain to identify nutritious, surplus, and safe food that for whatever reason would be discarded, and instead of discarding it, uh, redistribute it to people facing food insecurity 
or nutrition insecurity. Um, uh, the model originated um, in the U.S. many, many years ago, but today these grassroots organizations exist in more than 50 countries worldwide. Um, the organization like I said, that I support focuses predominantly on these organizations in emerging and developing markets. Um, the, uh, the vast majority of our members are located in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and then Asia Pacific Oceania. We do have a member based in Shanghai, although it's quite small, potentially there might be uh, uh, more, um, more food banks in China as time goes on, especially given the amazing enabling environment created by the Chinese government. Um, and uh, on top of that, uh, you know, so not only are these organizations increasing food access for about 32 million people, they are also making a significant contribution to mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in fact, we estimated last year that these organizations mitigated about 1.5 million metric tons of CO2e. Now, that really brings me to talking more about how can we better understand the possibility of using this model um, as a climate mitigation technique, not just for CO2e, but also for methane. Um, so we are very fortunate to have a project with the Global Methane Hub, and what we're doing is we're taking a look at where food banks in our network are sourcing surplus food. So Schengen talked about really reducing food waste at the consumer level. Our model really focuses on the loss and waste occurring on farm all the way down to food service. In fact, if you were to look at all the food being redistributed by our network across the world, the vast majority of it is coming from manufacturing companies, from processors and wholesalers, and increasingly from agriculture. Retail was a very big supply prior to the pandemic, but of course, as we all know, supply chains have been very tight since COVID, um, so retail is not as important of a source for food banks as it has been in previous years. Um, then in the terms of the types of food that are being sourced, um, far and away, the most significant type of food being redistributed across our network is fruits and vegetables. Most of those are coming from agriculture and from retail or from informal markets. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, there's a number of other sources that would be considered to be highly nutritious food. So we were taking a look at all of these sources and thinking about, okay, how can we better track um, the, again, the CO2 mitigation opportunity here and the methane mitigation opportunity. Um, and so what we're putting together is a methodology specifically for that. Now, there's a lot of methodologies on how you calculate the carbon um, emission mitigation for food loss and waste being um, put into place right now. But what we're really focusing on with the Global Methane Hub is making sure the methodology takes into account what we call the food loss and waste hierarchy. And so that's really if food is, um, if, <laughs> if food is edible, is surplus, is wholesome and nutritious, First and foremost, um, if it, that loss and waste cannot be prevented, it should be kept in the human supply chain. So the methodology is being put together is really trying to weight the fact that how do we prioritize and incentivize surplus food being kept in the supply chain so it can be used for human consumption. So we're carrying out two pilots. One is in Mexico and the second is in Ecuador. And our plan is to expand this pilot um, to uh, a country in sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia Pacific in the next 12 months. Um, and we're piloting, of course, this methodology on methane mitigation avoidance, and then also the technological tools that we can be using so that we can have really good calculations and data to back this up. Now, the goal, of course, with all of this is to be thinking about some of the commitments that some countries are making around the NDCs, and specifically how to incorporate food systems targets into nationally determined contributions by COP30. Um, and so the methodology is being developed so that if a country in its focus on food systems specifically wants to tackle food loss and waste, which not a lot of countries have included in their NDCs right now, that this methodology would be in place so that there would be a very strong evidential base for that. So um, that's a little bit about the work that we're doing specifically on the climate side, and we're very excited about the possibility of really bringing together not only the humanitarian challenge of malnutrition and food insecurity, but also the climate challenge that we are all here to discuss and hopefully tackle. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, very much, Lisa, uh, for the presentation. 
sorry about the file uh, that couldn't yeah, open. Uh, very wonderful uh, presentation. I think uh, we should all consider how the food waste should be uh, calculated into the uh, national uh, determined country, uh, the, uh, the uh, contribution. Uh, but actually, there is one organization in Guangdong where our uh, uh, office is close uh, about the uh, food banking. Uh, they, there is, so maybe we can, you know, talk a little bit. Of, yes, yeah, yes. Okay, so our next speaker, uh, I'm sorry, is uh, Sebastian Munden. Uh, he is the uh, chair of of the uh, RAP. I'm sorry. sorry. Did I miss? Mess the uh, order. Okay, so let's let's go with uh, Sebastian. Okay, uh, he is the chair of of RAP, and he has a uh, thirty years experience in the fast moving consumer product industry. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Yes, so um, I'm Sebastian Munn, and I'm uh, the chair of RAP, the Waste and Resources Action Program. We're a global action NGO working on the underlying causes of greenhouse gases, pollution and waste, tackling uh, the uh, kind of linear economy with circular solutions. Um, and my, uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, across the world on mobilizing citizens and communities to reduce food waste. I think this theme of system mobilization uh, is a, a theme that's becoming even more uh, kind of pressing. Uh, but just to kind of uh, level set at the beginning, here's a stat from the UK that whilst 81% uh, of UK citizens are concerned about climate change, only about a third or less uh, see the connection between food waste and climate change. So we've all got uh, a bit of work to do on that. Um, and uh, of course, um, one of the stats that actually does help to start mobilise um, citizen awareness is the one you heard right at the beginning which is that if food waste was a country, it would be the third most emitting country. This, this stat alone can start to at least get eyebrows to rise and people to sort of start paying attention. Uh, so uh, top tip uh, on that stat. Um, what RAP has done is actually try and create a sort of pathway for a solution and show and work out all the various different levers of um, uh, greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and food waste plays a central part in that. Um, so, systemic uh, ways of tackling food waste, um, I mean, clearly uh, generating less waste at every stage is a key um, kind of thought, whether that's at the, kind of at the end at the municipality level, or in home, or in store, or in food service, in production and packaging, and then on farm. Um, and you, you saw earlier, um, you know, um, the, the, the kind of detailed type of uh, analysis that can be required to identify where the problem is. But in the end, it's about changing behaviours, whether um, it's the behaviours um, in, in food service, in store or in home. And, and they actually all um, revolve around a certain number of themes. Although the words you might use in a domestic situation may be different, they're all about storage, forecasting or buying, reuse, uh, redistribution, collection, and um, uh, composting or anaerobic uh, digestion. So um, in order to uh, do that, you have to kind of start setting targets. If you don't measure it, you can't set any targets. But I'm going to talk about some key interventions with citizens and households, uh, having not only me measured the quantities, but studied some of the behaviors of waste. And that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. Um, that we've uh, gleaned and applied this across a network of um, uh, food waste uh, public-private partnerships. Um, this was a slide that we made earlier. In fact, this slide's already out of date because uh, that West Coast US um, uh, food program, food waste program, has now just gone national. But that really shows that the, this is uh, speeding up. But some of the data that we've got in depth, I'm going to take from the UK as an example. Uh, so if we take uh, this uh, fact from 2021, UK homes threw away six, about 6.5 six million tonnes of food and drink. The total value of that was about £17 billion. But £3 billion out of the 17 
was food past its use-by date. Um, and on average, you know, that has quite a high numerical value, about a thousand pounds for a household of four. Um, and um, we'll, we'll come back to, you know, some of the um, kind of financial motivations uh, that will align uh, with food waste reduction. If you look at that in carbon terms, um, the carbon associated with wasted food is equivalent to that generated by one in five cars. Um, so um, these kind of uh, stats um, don't in themselves do much for citizens, but they certainly mobilize our teams. Um, so if we come down to the analysis now um, and look at the sort of contributions, um, not used in time is all that sort of um, blue area from 12 o'clock round to 4 o'clock. And the team have divided it between you know, things that smelled and looked off, as it were, and things that were just identified as past the date on the label. And you'll see that that's about 38% of all uh, food waste was because it didn't smell right or it was past its date. Actually, this stuff that's past its date could actually be quite consumable. And so that was identified early on as a, as a first area to go for, which was the amount of waste which is created by people going, oh, that was yesterday, and throw it out. So we'll come back to some of the interventions on that. Some of the other main reasons, a quarter is because it, too much has been prepared, um, and just under a quarter is because people didn't like it. Um, so these are some of the kind of areas to go after. So if we kind of hone in on these best before dates and used by dates, um, what we um, uh, did um, in uh, consultation and partnership with the UK grocery industry is really start to take any of those dates off that didn't need to be there, moving any use-bys to best before, um, uh, if there had to be a date at all. And this has been a rolling program of uh, hundreds and hundreds of dates coming off. Um, so why um, uh, did that work? Uh, um, the evidence is that it does work because effectively people then have to smell it, look at it, and judge, is it really off? Um, so this has been a, a, a work in progress, it's still going on, but it's definitely a very, very productive avenue for um, uh, reducing uh, food waste in the home. Another one um, is uh, at the intersection of, of reducing plastic waste and food waste. It doesn't get much better than this. Uh, and uh, that was really understanding when you uh, have bagged up fruit and vegetable, so that's uncut fruit and vegetable, um, what you start to see is that people have to buy in certain quantities because the bag says so, and the result of that is people buying slightly differently from what they want, usually too much because nobody wants to buy too little. Um, so um, the team at RAP um, did some tests on apples, bananas, broccolis, cucumber, and potatoes. Um, and what they found is that if you sold them le loose and removed any dates you could uh, really save around 100,000 tonnes of household food waste in the UK. That's about 10,500 tonnes of plastic and 130,000 tonnes of CO2. And this comes from people basically just buying the right amount. The last intervention I wanted to uh, talk about uh, is about the fridge and getting the fridge to the right degree. This was a campaign that was been running, um, storing, um, turning the fridge down to five degrees Celsius. And again, the tests show that at four degrees Celsius, uh, apples uh, d don't deteriorate uh, for another two and a half months past the dates that were being put on them. Uh, and broccoli showed no signs of deterioration for two weeks beyond its date. So this combination of turning the fridge down to five Celsius and doing a bit of fridge education, not putting milk in the door, sorry about that people, um, and other very uh, easy uh, tips as to how to really use your fridge. Now, all of this is supported by a campaign, and this campaign is running in uh, many countries in the world, the Love Food, Hate Waste, and it really um, has evolved from being a sort of motivational campaign, now with more tips and tools, uh, but increasingly we know that campaigns have to actually work in concert with the in-store environment and using the in-store environment to shape our um, uh, sort of edited choices for citizens when they're shopping. Uh, as I say, um, we now use this brand in many countries around the world, um, and uh, it, it does seem to work extremely well. 
The last little word on collection and reprocessing. Um, it's um, important that um, in, a, in a country like the UK with the climate that we have, the amount of space and, and, and the climate is not really that conducive to private household composting cycle times. So, but nonetheless, you know, collecting food waste from households and taking it to municipal processing uh, can be an excellent alternative to make sure that food waste doesn't end up in landfill or incineration. So that's a little bit of an insight into the work that the team are doing at RAP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Excellent uh, presentation. Um, I particularly think the customers, including myself, needs to be educated regarding the you know, best date, because I usually you know, sometimes throw things and wondering if it's a good practice. Yes, excellent. Uh, our next speaker will be Sahil Preka. Uh, he is from the uh, Indian-based uh, organization called the CEW again. And at the council, he leads the work on uh, advancing policies in a holistic food system approach. The floor is yours, Sahil. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, it's a really important day for um, food and agriculture and water today. And uh, it's a great opportunity for me to be talking on uh, this important topic. Thank you to the Wanki Foundation and the Guangdong Low Carbon Development Promotion Association for having me here. Um, let me start off by saying that the topic of food waste and community approaches is very close to my heart because of two reasons. Um, right now, I work in the space of public policy, but in my previous avatar, I was a social entrepreneur um, promoting urban farming and community composting solutions in New Delhi. And so today, I am sort of going to wear these two hats as I take you all through my presentation. Uh, a little bit about my organization first. The Council on Energy, Environment, and Water is a not-for-profit policy organization based in New Delhi, India, that is impacting sustainable development at scale through data, integrated analysis, and strategic outreach. We, our work can be combined into three different uh, work streams. On the left-hand side are the transformations, where we work on promoting a low-carbon economy, uh, ensuring an energy transition that is just and renewable, working in areas of power markets, industrial sustainability, ensuring sustainable livelihoods. Uh, then the next pillar of work is on the quality of life, where uh, my program fits in the sustainable food systems. Uh, and then we also work on ensuring an enabling environment by ensuring sustainable finance, uh, ensuring appropriate technology futures, circular economy, and so on. We have a multidisciplinary team of 250 professionals uh, from different streams of education, and our engagements are with 22 out of 27 states in India. Um, last year, we were knowledge partners to the government of India as it undertook the G20 presidency, and we helped uh, build the knowledge required for uh, the government to carry on the discussions for 11 different ministries. Um, so the kind of presentation that I want to make today is a little bit different from what the other panelists have spoken about, uh, and I want all of us to sort of take a step back to understand what is that framework that helps build sustainable and scalable solutions? What is that framework that helps us think of the DNA of scalable and sustainable solutions? And so that is where this uh, report that we've worked on uh, comes useful. It's called How to Design Scalable and Sustainable Programs. And using this report, we have um, we've, we've done a few things which I would like to highlight. One is um, this report has enabled us to budget for uh, a particular state called Rajasthan in India uh, to scale its sustainable agriculture program up, which districts to approach, what kind of approaches to follow, and so on. Uh, we are also building the capacity of four different state governments to advance climate-smart agriculture in the country. 
Um, we are building a multi-stakeholder initiative to promote tree-based farming and agroforestry and other nature-based solutions in the country. And we have recently completed, so 5th of December was the World Soil Day, and we've submitted a draft policy document for sustainable soil management using some of the principles uh, of this particular report. So, so let me go deeper into this. Um, before that, just wanted to sort of mention that the development sector is sort of satirically called the graveyard of pilots because somehow, at least in India, there are so many pilots that don't go beyond that particular scale. It's a pilot receives funding, it runs for a couple of years, and then it naturally dies down because the community is not able to pick it up. Uh, and so therefore, what are some of those critical areas where the program needs to develop so that it naturally gets taken up in the community? So one is empower the community to take decisions, embed the initiative within existing government policies. Uh, the leadership of the program should have enough motivation to keep driving it. There should be a steady and diverse source of funding. Uh, initially, it can be philanthropic funding, but eventually it will have to find its own uh, business models. And lastly, there should be a sync between the solution and the enabling environment. When a program runs for many years, uh, its outcomes no longer remain relevant if, if it continues chasing the same outcomes that it started with. And so from that point of view, uh, it constantly needs to adapt to the changing environment. So our study is based on six different case studies of successful models <coughs> excuse me, that uh, have scaled up in India. The first one is called the Andhra Pradesh Community Managed Natural Farming. This is a mega project in one of the states in southern India, which now has six million farmers under its fold. Uh, it started out as a government initiative, but eventually it has been taken up in a very community-based approach <clears throat> where the program leadership has been transferred to the community, especially to uh, women-led self-help groups who have created small pockets of uh, these sustainable agricultural systems. The next one is uh, called the Tusser Silk Value Chain by a community-based uh, community organization called Pradhan. Um, it has 50,000 families uh, spread out across three states in India. And the aim is to improve the livelihood of the marginalized community by encouraging them to take up uh, silk cultivation. And again, this has been a successful model because it has created leadership in the community by uh, enabling market support. The third one is the Odisha Millets Mission. If any of you all were at the India Pavilion today, you all might have uh, seen the principal secretary of the state talk about this. Um, it has 250,000 farmers as of today um, that are growing millets. It's a fork to farm approach which really uh, creates a circular economy around uh, millets and connecting the, fork, uh, connecting the farm to the fork. Um, here again, while the program is based in the government's institutional structure, I think it is significantly successful because um, it has been picked up by the community. Uh, I'm not going to focus a lot on these three because they are not very related to the food systems uh, work. But in any case, all of them are also examples where the community has come together either with the business or with the government um, uh, to build a program that has scaled up. So what are the different success factors that are integral for scalability and sustainability? The first one, as I said, is institutionalization in the community where transferring the agency of taking decisions and actions to the community is really important. Institutionalization in the government, uh, embedding the initiative within one of the ongoing programs is important. Sustained leadership in the organization, the person driving the program should be motivated to keep driving the program and there should be a smooth transition when the goals and objectives of the program are going to change. Financial sustainability, and sync between the solution and the enabling environment. Um, without going into the details of what these diagrams mean, um, 
here we have identified a lot of factors and sub-factors, and I would en encourage you all to take a look at uh, the report which is up on our website. It identifies different factors and sub-factors that are needed for ensuring institutionalization in the community. And similarly, factors and sub-factors that are needed for ensuring institutionalization in the government, and so on. So for each of the five success factors, we have really broken it down to at least four layers of actions. So the innermost layer is kind of very abstract, but then when you go right to the outermost level, you realize that there are some very tangible actions. And this is a live document. It is work in progress where the community constantly keeps adding the different actions and activities they can undertake. Um, some practical um, uh, insights that come from the institutionalization on the community, and I would like to highlight them here. One is start solving the most urgent problem. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So the first one is start with solving the most urgent problem. Here, narrative is important, just as an example. When composting solutions are sort of taken up in the community, for the low-income group, a better way to do it is to focus on nutrition, uh, because the compost then gets used in the urban farm. That leads to nutrition uh, benefits for the community. But for, in a high, but for a high income group, for example, uh, we noticed that tackling foul smell was a much more important narrative to focus on. Um, and so therefore, it's really important to shape how the program sort of starts. Uh, regular communication with the community champions is important. It is important to build the trust of these champions, and it will only work if the program works for them. And if they find value in the program, they will take up all the efforts uh, themselves. It is important to set up the necessary value chains. Uh, so solutions are viable when they rely on well-functioning value chains. For example, composting services, gardeners, seeds, saplings, all of this will have to be enabled if we think of some sort of a com composting solution. Uh, I see that I am limited on time, and so I'm going to uh, skip the rest of the points here, uh, because I do want to also mention uh, this initiative by the government of India before I stop. And so reducing waste and adopting a sustainable food system has been institutionalized in India at the highest level. Uh, the Honorable Prime Minister in uh, earlier COP had announced the Lifestyle for Environment, which is an India-led global mass movement to nudge individual and community action. Um, three areas are important here. One is adopting a healthy lifestyle. Another is reducing waste and adopting a sustainable food system. And I think these kinds of approaches have been common in India. They have been successful. I would like to point you to the first one, which is the um, Swachh Sagar, Surakshit Sagar. What, which was a campaign to remove plastic waste from the beaches in India, and 15,000 tons of waste was removed uh, from 75 beaches in 75 days through community action. Yeah, with that, I stop my presentation. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. Thank you very much, Sahil. I think the leadership and the institutionalization you mentioned is very critical, and we are trying to build that, that in our project, too, in China. Uh, our next speaker is Yvette Cabrera. Uh, she's from the NRDC. She's the uh, director of uh, uh, Food Waste. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Hello. Um, first off, I want to say thank you so much to the Vanka Foundation for hosting this wonderful event and to all the speakers. Um, I'm honored to be here. So um, for those of you <clears throat> excuse me, who don't know NRDC, it stands for Natural Resources Defense Council. And we are an environmental nonprofit. Um, the majority of um, NRDC employees are located in the United States, um, scattered throughout the United States. But we also have offices in India and in China. Um, and we have been around for more than 50 years. We actually started off as an environmental advocacy organization, and over the years we've really grown our body of work um, to be also focused on programmatic work. Um, and it really, what we work on really ranges from suing polluters to 
protecting whales to uh, reducing food waste, which is what I'm here to tell you a little bit more about today. Um, so on this slide here, we've, I've tried to visually represent how NRDC does its policy work. Um, we work at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. And we do so because we firmly believe that our impact will be greater when we're able to work at all three levels and ensure that what we're doing is mutually reinforcing. So I'll tell you a little bit about an example as to how we do that. Um, but at the federal level, we work in coalition with federal actors, um, such as federal regulatory bodies, federal agencies, government officials, um, and also a, a huge swath of environmental nonprofits, of food rescuers, food banks, um, and other actors within the US that are interested in moving policy at the federal level. And we work on passing food waste policies. We heard a little bit uh, from RAP about um, their work on food date labels. That's also a federal policy that we are working on in the United States. It's a huge contributor to food waste in the US. Um, and at the state level, we partner with governor's offices, um, state regulatory agencies, and we aim to pass and implement food waste policies like organic waste bans. Um, and an organic waste ban essentially means that we ban organic waste from entering a landfill or an incinerator. And this is one of our kind of primary policy tools for um, addressing food waste. Um, and then at the local level, we work across city and county governments with local stakeholders to implement food waste programs and policies that serve as case studies to influence action at the state and federal level. And much of this work happens through NRDC's Food Matters initiative. Um, and so now I want to um, show you kind of geographically how we think about our work. So, um, all of these dots represent uh, cities that we work with currently in the U.S. or cities that we've worked with in the past. And then it also, um, the kind of states that, are, uh, that have lines in them represent the states that we work with. And then we also work at the national level. And has anybody seen this graphic before or something that looks like this? Okay, I'm getting some head nods. Lisa Moon earlier uh, mentioned the food recovery hierarchy, and I wanted to take a moment to show you all um, what this food recovery hierarchy looks like because it is a framework that guides how NRDC does our work. I know um, the writing is very small on the slide. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, this is what I believe to be uh, one of the kind of best food waste graphics out there. This is from an organization called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance um, that's based in the U.S. Um, and what it does is actually interpret uh, the Environmental Protection Agency's food recovery hierarchy uh, to demonstrate what the environmental and climate impacts of food waste solutions looks like. It essentially ranks them. But then it also looks at how we can focus um, on our, our food waste solutions on community, um, which is why I really love this graphic here. So you can see here um, that when we focus our solutions higher up the hierarchy, the kind of community orientedness is also stronger. Uh, this is where NRDC focuses the majority of our food waste work. And why is this important? So in the US, um, and I think this applies na uh, nationally as well, we, when we better utilize our food resources, we have the opportunity to feed people. And you know, we've heard a lot about the work that these um, other organizations are doing here. Food is a very personal issue, it's a personal thing. It's something that connects us to our community, to our culture. Um, and when we kind of are able to focus on feeding people and using that as a mechanism to simultaneously reduce food waste, we can increase our impact. Um, and by focusing on community level solutions, we have the opportunity to combat some of the negative impacts of waste in our communities. So in the US, almost 80% of landfills and incinerators are located in communities of color or low income communities. And this is a huge environmental justice issue. These communities face serious health concerns. Um, they, the, the landfills and incinerators affect the air that they breathe, the soil that they um, garden on or live on, um, and the water that they drink. 
And on the flip side, when we focus on addressing food waste at the community level, we have an opportunity to create more jobs and to keep valuable resources like compost we make from food scraps in our community. And we also have the opportunity to address centuries of depleting our soils, stealing our soils resources, and when we can put compost back into our soil, we can restore to the land what was taken from it. So we're talking a lot about metrics and impact today, so I wanted to kind of just show you a picture of why we focus higher up the hierarchy. Um, and so here we go. You can see on the very bottom here, uh, this is a, assuming a scenario of 500,000 tons of food. So if we can prevent 500,000 tons of food from being wasted, it's as if we were to prevent the emissions happening from 500,000 vehicles annually. Now, if we composted that same amount of food, it would be like preventing 68,000 vehicles emissions annually. Now, when we landfill that same amount of food, we're having a negative impact. So it would be as if we emitted the emissions from 55,000 vehicles annually. So this is really why NRDC focuses where we do. And I, I, it also sounds like many of my colleagues here on the stage do as well. So um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of how NRDC does our work. Um, I mentioned we focus a lot on prevention. And what does that mean? Um, in, it can mean a lot of things, and, but it essentially means preventing food from being wasted in the first place. And how do we do that? So one way um, is to raise awareness in communities about the impacts of food waste and what individuals might be able to do in their homes to better utilize the food uh, that they have and make it last longer. And we have done a lot of work on this front. We actually launched an entire campaign called Save the Food in the United States. Um, and this is actually a picture of one of the billboards uh, from our Save the Food campaign in Nashville, Tennessee. And these billboards could be seen across the country. Um, you could hear our ads on the radio, um, on television. We have a full-blown website. Um, and related to this campaign, we did a series of studies and um, surveys. And we learned that after multiple years of implementation of this campaign, Almost seven in 10 adults agreed that their individual actions could make a difference in reducing food waste. So this was really our goal is when we started off is to raise awareness about this issue among consumers. And now what we, we've moved more towards uh, changing behavior now that we kind of feel that there is a general awareness about the issues of food waste. Now, based on RAP study, I do know that we still have more work to do to connect the issue of food waste to climate change, um, but this is, was for us a very positive outcome. And I'm gonna quickly go through these. Um, I also wanted to mention, we know, we've learned a lot about um, doing campaign work in the United States. We know that many of our um, assets and kind of messages that we've produced through our campaign are not suitable or appealable to all communities. The US is very diverse. Um, I know that's true for many, many other countries. Um, and so what we heard from many of our partners is that they wanted a campaign that spoke to their local demographics, aesthetics, et cetera. And so we partner with city governments to actually adapt our campaign assets to their local environment. And here's just an example of what that looks like in Baltimore. Um, and almost done. Um, we um, also work a lot on community composting in cities. Um, so on this slide, you'll see a picture of one of our closest partners. This is Marvin and Kenny from the Baltimore uh, Compost Collective in the city of Baltimore. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to mention why we do this work in Baltimore. Um, so when we started working with Baltimore back in 2016, they came to us because they have an incinerator located in the middle of their city that causes massive amounts of health concerns, as I was mentioning earlier, and they want to shut that incinerator down. And now, when, in order to shut that incinerator down, they have to figure out what to do with all of the material that's going into that incinerator. And when they looked at it, 40% of that material was organic waste. And so what we did was partner with the city and with local partners within the city to help them develop a system to process organic waste locally. Um, and while we are moving towards kind of 
city-wide scale, we started at the community level. And so you'll see some of our wins here, um, but we built a robust network of community compost sites throughout the city. Um, we developed food scrap drop-off points throughout the city, like at, at farmer's markets, for example. We established a system to move food scraps to local hog farms and process it as animal feed. Um, and now we have, after many years of work, we have um, actually worked with the city of Baltimore to secure a $4 million grant from the Federal Environmental Protection Agency to build a state-of-the-art composting facility. And this is really important because the city of Baltimore is also committed to putting in $4 million of their own city budget. Um, and this is due to years of advocacy of making this issue kind of be at the forefront um, on the city agenda. And I will just leave you with this. Um, I love this quote from the Eat Lancet report that um, food is the single strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability. And this is really why we do this work and we think we have a huge lever through our food waste work. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Yvette. I think uh, what I like the most about you, my personally, is you connected the amount of uh, food wasted and the carbon emission, but also at a community level, you connect how people uh, manage or want their community to be and uh, come back to the com community composting. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, so we're gonna uh, have our uh, Q&A and the panel discussion session. I wanna first open to our audience, see if I have any questions first. Uh, from the audience to our panelists. Yes, please. Can you, uh, can we get the mic? Hello, good afternoon everyone. I'm Yobel from Global Alliance for Incidental Alternatives, uh, or Gaia. Um, thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, I've been here with our delegation uh, for two weeks and there's a huge conversation going on about making climate finance going to technology transfer, and most of them, to be honest, are directed towards the end of five. One of them is, one of them is uh, incineration as end of five. End of five. So um, my question is, uh, as people who are advocating to move the money and investment and for resources to communities to move towards the upper hierarchy, how do you find this, and what would be your recommendation, especially? towards the end of the COP, and then we're expecting to be having more climate conversation, uh, climate finance conversation next year. What would be your uh, suggestions or uh, your call to action? Thank you. Is there any particular panelist you want to ask this question to, or? Uh, anyone. Uh, it seems like they're talking more okay. or less uh, the same topics. We're going to volunteer to speak to, to respond to the question. OK. Anybody? Want? Yeah. I could do a quick answer. And thank you for that question. Um, I. There is a lot of talk around how we kind of channel um, climate finance towards food system solutions. Um, and I think that the best answer I can give is if we're talking about finance, we have to demonstrate what the return on investment might be for these solutions. And we have a really good opportunity. I think that's one of the beauties of um, waste is that it's pretty easy to quantify. Um, of course, it takes money, it takes resources to do that, um, and it takes partnerships to be able to do that in a, in, at a large scale. But we really need to focus in on, on measurement and reporting those metrics to um, folks involved with climate finance that might be able to, to help with that. I think that that would be a huge lever to channel those funds in the right way. Okay, thanks, Yvette. Uh, any other panelists who wanna add? I can uh, respond a little bit as well. Um, so if we see the developments that have happened in COP, uh, we see that the global stock take document draft that has uh, come out, it doesn't really mention food systems uh, at all. I think fundamentally that will have to change. Um, we must first give due importance to sustainable agriculture, but we must also move beyond that and start thinking of food systems in a holistic manner. Until we do that, I, I really don't think we'll be able to move the needle on climate finance coming to food, more so coming to a topic like food waste. Okay, uh, thanks, Sahil. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Can you, yeah, can you say which, which organization you're associated with, then the question? Yes, Hu Tao from the Lakestone Institute for Sustainable Development, Shenzhen, China. So thank you very much for your excellent presentations. Very interesting. And by the way, nice meeting you again. 
Professor Fan here. And uh, I have a specific question to Lisa and the event about uh, your, especially I'm interested in your missing heart research work. A question to you too is, which is com combustion uh, incineration landfill, which is less or more climate friendly approach to deal with the waste? You give us an example, 50, uh, 500 uh, tons of waste you can prevent, but uh, it seems like uh, uh, landfill is better than land, uh, uh, combustion is better than landfill. How about incineration? Which is the best way? If we combine carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases. Thank you very much. I can, yeah, I can start off. Um, I, well, I don't have the exact numbers around the, the emissions in front of me. Um, I, if you haven't seen it already, the Environmental Protection Agency recently released um, a new version of that hierarchy. It actually looks like a, a scale. Um, and what it does is update the rankings of the environmental impacts of different food waste solutions. And they actually put landfills um, and incineration in in the same bucket, which is the worst possible solution that you could pursue. Now, I will say NRDC as an organization, um, we do not support incineration as um, a, a solution to dealing with waste. Um, while obviously there are still many uh, incineration facilities throughout the world, we really want to move um, actors away from incineration um, and from landfills. But the frankly, they're, they're equally as bad. And there may be some kind of fluctuation within the emissions. Um, but what we want to do is really move people away from those solutions and think about preventing that from happening in the first place. And I'm happy to follow up with more specific emission data if that's helpful. And in terms of our research with uh, specifically on methane, we are looking at um, methane um, emissions avoided. So it's not actually uh, it depends on the context. So where um, the pilot is running at five different uh, locations in Mexico, there's different destinations for food waste. Um, you know, sometimes it's landfill, sometimes it's incineration. It depends on that context. Same thing as in Ecuador. But as Yvette said, we're really focused more on kind of the prioritizing, keeping it in the human supply chain. And then if not, there's a number of other pathways you could go to before it could be disposed of in that way. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if not at the moment, I would like to ask you a few questions. Uh, uh, a couple of questions to uh, Professor Fan about the policy, uh, because we all know policy can play, and the regulation can play a big role. As you presented, that uh, many policies and regulations come out in Chongqing and, uh, and other local level. Uh, what, what are the challenges when policymakers uh, are making policy? What the challenges they face in terms of implementing effective policies and regulations? What, any, you know? I yeah. think the challenge they face is lack of information, lack of data, and a lack of different options. Mm. So as a researcher, we always try to pr provide that to policymakers. And then one of the challenges we are facing right now uh, is the subsidies. Right now, globally, Agriculture subsidy is about seven hundred billion dollars. Seven hundred billion dollars. Um, so we're talking about a financing, lack of money, lack of investment. But seven hundred billion dollars are there in subsidizing water, fertilizers, pesticides, output price to produce rice, wheat, maize. And from our study, we show that these subsidies are not sustainable. They use overuse water. They overuse fertilizers. They emit more carbon emissions, of di carbon dioxide and, uh, and methanes. So we needed to repurpose these subsidies. So instead of subsidizing production, we could use that subsidies. Still, we still keep them in food and agriculture, but use these subsidies to promote more healthy food production, more sustainable food production, for example, healthy ones, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, including alternative proteins. Uh, we have some, some uh, stakeholders, alternative proteins. And supporting 
food banks. So yes, and Lisa said that you know I'm very proud to be uh, a board member of the Global Food Banking Network. I mean, this the food banks in China. Yeah, I know there's one in Guangdong, there's yeah. one in Shanghai, but nowhere compared to U.S. to Latin America. Very small, very small operation. So now you're talking about policy. I think one is to repurpose these policies to to support not just the, the the production, the whole value chain of healthy, nutritious, sustainable uh, food, food, but equally to support institutions like the, let's say, some of the NGOs here, food banks. In many countries, food banks, one is the government simply does not recognize the importance of food banks. Secondly, there are lots of barriers for NGOs like food banks, let's say, to it's a, to register, to, it's a, to access to food from, let's say, from the whole value chain companies. And I think we're removing this, this barrier is so critical so they can access to surplus foods. And also to donate the, let's say, the normal citizens to donate their foods, even their cash to food banks. Right now in China, probably many countries, we still, have, we still don't have tax benefits. So if you donate your money, there's no tax benefits. Maybe even more hurdles to do that. Then, um, so I think the other one is a, is a carbon credit. You know, if the reducing food waste and loss can help to sequestrate the carbon, reduce, reduce the carbon methane, then if there's a carbon markets, then that activity should be compensated through the carbon markets. So for example, the food banks or others can help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They got to be paid, paid at a fair price. Right now, I think the carbon market in China almost collapsed. Very little, very low price. 10 yuan, maybe 20 yuan per ton, but globally it's $60, maybe even $100 in, Euro in European countries. So if we truly let the carbon market work, increase the carbon price, and to develop certain carbon mechanisms or carbon market to make sure that who reduces emissions, who should be compensated. Obviously, you know, consumers or food banks, and also even smallholder farmers. The farmers develop certain technologies. I think that's the, in this case, smart agriculture, carbon, or, or carbon smart agriculture. So the far, if farmers can reduce <coughs> carbon dioxide or even methane, methane from livestock and from, from rice, they should be compensated. But right now, there's no incentive. So I think I'm so happy. I was part of this, the, the, the reference group or the advisory group to the the declaration of sustainable food systems. So reducing food waste loss is there, innovation is there, and the carbon market is there. But we must move from declaration to real action. And this is the slogan we use in this COP. So hopefully when we move to COP29, COP2030, we don't need to discuss about this. We just move actions. Thank you. Excellent. Any speakers want to respond to Professor Fan's comments? OK, I'll move to the, uh, the next question uh, will be given to Sebastian regarding the business uh, practices. Like you said, uh, you know, the food is a labor, the, the, the best use date, and that usually uh, confuse consumers with, you know, the quality of the, uh, the food actual. Uh, situation. So to change that business practice, what would be their concerns and uh, what can give their incentives to you know, jump in and participate in this change? Well, I think you've got to start with the fact that um, you're trading off food safety, food waste, and, and packaging waste. And so you've got to find the equilibrium between those three things. So actually, it's, it's a purely scientific activity in that sense. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion uh, around, for instance, the, you know, uh, films around cucumbers, which is a, you know, a plastic versus cucumber shelf life discussion. 
So I think, I think allowing the, the science to flow through and, and to balance that off and not to get sort of tunnel vision on any one of those targets is really important. I think particularly um, in, in Western Europe and um, in, in the US where supermarkets tend to be some of the larger companies uh, in the economy, there's so much um, uh, kind of scrutiny now on the uh, carbon footprint of those businesses and so much um, you know, kind of real uh, action behind trying to reduce that. Um, you know, one UK supermarket, for instance, uh, put redistribution targets at end of day into the uh, management incentive plan for store managers. You know, we saw redistribution for that chain go from about 50% to 80% in the first year. Uh, so there are uh, mechanisms that businesses have that can encourage people to do the right thing. Um, and uh, at RAP, you know, we convene a lot of these uh, public-private partnerships where we bring business, NGOs, government together. Um, you know, and that's all around setting targets, setting a baseline, measuring progress, and creating action plans. And actually, that's how business gen generally does think and work. So you're going with the mojo um, if you can present it in that way. And, and coming back to an earlier question, I think it's also if governments aren't quite sure exactly what legislation to put in place, sometimes participating in public-private partnership, you can hear, you know, well, what would actually help raise the floor? Generally speaking, that's what legislation does. It raises the floor. You know, good examples would be from a parallel world, you know, um, uh, plastic tax and incentivizing recycled plastic material. It raises the floor. Um, you know, and maybe there's a scope for that kind of activity here as well. Hmm. Excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah, uh, similarly, we are also partner in Vanka Foundation. We are also partner with the a big organization in China called the Palace Museum. Uh, uh, through them, we teach the, there are two million, 20 million visitors each year. But working with them, we just found that shrinking the plate they use in their, uh, their canteen is actually reduced 10% of the f food waste. Just, you know, yeah, the, because the plate is smaller, then people tend to so order less. So bringing that whole behavioral science um, understanding to bear and um, nudging I mean, it's absolutely, um, you know, tried and tested now. Where I used to work at Unilever, we also did that exercise and you know, reducing um, staff canteen food waste, and it, it works a treat. Mm. Um, so, so I think the, the day has come, really, for the behavioral scientists and the, the marketers to get together and help shape different behaviors, whether that's inside business or with citizens and customers. But... but but it's going gonna, it's gonna to need that sort of, um, you know, precision and, and proven insight and acting at scale on proven insight. That's what's going to make such a big difference. And I think that's, in a way, what the power of, of business can bring to accelerate the journey to the sustainable economy, more sustainable economy. Excellent. Um, the last question, not last, but last question from me is the, about the culture. Because I th always think about the food waste and how we consume food and how to deal with the waste is very much the diet, tradition, you know, culture thing. Uh, I want to give this question to Bei Bei and, and also to Sadrio. Uh, sorry, Lisa, which country are you from? Lisa? United States. United States, okay. I'll give the questions to three of you. <laughs> India, China, and the United States regarding your culture, uh, like a response to your campaigns. Uh, how would the people, you know, from their tradition, culture, and their food diet respond to your, uh, your, your call? Uh, can I start with Bebe? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Uh, in our Chinese food culture, <clears throat> seafood food is a very, uh, very, very uh, traditional virtue, such as, uh, such as the last, uh, the last uh, food in the bowl. In the bowl. We just call the fu di, ah, ah. You just you you have the the last uh, food in the bowl. You have fu good fortune today. Yes, it's a very uh, good virtue. <laughs> ah, another uh, we uh, in order to cut down the uh, food waste, we 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 advocate clean clean plate company. Company in our schools, restaurants, or our in family. 
uh, and this help us to reduce uh, food waste and uh, reduce the greenhouse emissions uh, in our in, in our uh, in our community and uh, mm. in our school. Yes. Any uh, like a negative <laughs> impact from a culture to to what we call reducing food waste. Um, our our con in our institutes have been committed to the low carbon communities, uh, uh, but we focus on the uh, community energy use. But we also uh, concern with foster and community uh, garbage classification. Just now, our experts uh, have very excellent ideas in the community. Uh, garbage re reduce, uh, but this this idea need the uh, best. Uh, you need much inve in investor of money, <laughs> and uh, uh, and other resource. Uh, mm -hmm. So we hope uh, in our Guangdong province we have more institutions and more researchers and more people to pay attention to our waste food. Mm -hmm. We together to put uh, the, uh, this in our in our company. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, this uh, let me to thank our co-organized uh, uh, Wanke Foundation uh, because they uh, they they put uh, uh, very very efforts in this workshop. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, baby. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Just uh, at one point that in China we tend to put a big banquet when we, you know, treat people, uh, treat our guests, and if the plate become empty in the end, it's kind of embarrassment for the host. So that itself create the traditional level create a, a, a problem. So yeah, can I go to Lisa regarding the negative and positive side from the culture and tradition? Yeah, so I think one of the things that, um, to kind of build on some of the discussions on policy, but I think in the United States and many places, there is very, a significant amount of attention paid to cosmetically how food looks, especially around fruits and vegetables, right? So you, when you're shopping, you want tomatoes and apples to look a very certain way. Um, and by the time it reaches, you know, people's households, it's, it's very, it's, it's late at that point to try to keep it in the human supply chain. It's very hard to recover food at the food service level or at household level while still preserving food safety. But what we have found, though, in this has been a major area of focus for our food banking organizations because they're really looking at export markets and working with growers that are contracted by retailers in higher income countries. Um, and what we're finding is that 50 to 60 percent of the fruit and veg that they are growing is not, doesn't meet the cosmetic standards um, for export. And so, th but we're able to recover a lot of that and redistribute it. But I do think this whole focus on perfection mm. um, in our food really contributes to a significant amount of waste at the household level, but not just that it has ramifications all the way down to the farm. Mm. So it's certainly something for us to consider. Excellent. Sahil? Yeah, thank you, Fong. Um, I think in the Indian culture, um, food has a lot of respect and therefore wasting food is something that is looked down upon significantly, at least that's how it was for me when I was growing up. Um, and and I, think, I think that is quite evident in uh, across different regions of India. Uh, I think we also place a disproportionate amount of effort on having a lifestyle that is more environmentally sustainable and environmentally friendly. And this goes beyond food waste. It, uh, it goes into a lot of different things. Uh, respect for the environment and mother nature is something, uh, without going into a lot of detail, it, it is part of a lot of religions in the country. And I think that is an important value that uh, that is so inherent to us that it, it helps us bring it to the food system as well. Um, however, I think um, food waste is not so much of an issue, but we realize that food loss is becoming a bigger and bigger issue in a country like India as we move ahead. Um, 
this is happening on two fronts. One, the fact that 30% or even more, around 40% of all the food that is grown by the farmers does not reach the plate. Uh, I think globally it's around 30%, but India is, is much higher than that. Um, so that is, is an increasing problem, and it is it even gets more exacerbated because of the fact that food prices, what the farmer makes, is are so low uh, in the country. Uh, and then the other part of the food loss problem is the increasing amount of uh, online cloud kitchens and delivery services that have started in Indian cities. <coughs> and because of the lack of, um, so again, two problems here, because of there being a lot of discounts, I think there's a lot of <coughs> over-ordering that happens uh, in, in the cities, and I'm saying this purely from anecdotal evidence and not uh, uh, statistical data. And then there is also the fact that all of that packaging <coughs> is, most of that packaging is not sustainable. Uh, so we are generating so much more plastic for every box of noodles and um, other food items that we order. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I think we are running out of time. Uh, not running, I still have a chance to give a one question chance to the audience if there's any. Oh, okay. Quick question, please. Quick question. I want to ha have a quick question to ask you, Professor Fan. You are definitely right. U.S. has a farm bill, and the EU has a common agricultural policy. China started subsidy for the agriculture as well. That's really, I think, uh, the worldwide public policies. My question to you as a research professor, so how can we encourage, ensure these national, federal policies, agricultural policy, subsidy policy to be the green box rather than red box or amber box? Thank you mm. very much. I think that can be quite a lot. It, uh, I, I have to ask the Professor Fan to give a very short question. Please. Yeah, well, I think um, so, um, sorry. to some extent we are already working on it. Like the European Union have reformed its common agriculture policy to reduce direct subsidies on production, to use the, uh, the support to support uh, the rural development, uh, to support ecological um, environment protection, and also to pay farmers through direct income support. So the European Union is already doing that. China also began to reform its policy, reduce the uh, fertilizer subsidy. I think fertilizer subsidy has stopped. Um, so instead of direct income support or compensate farmers for not using groundwater, for not using, uh, let's say, expand the land to a marginal land, uh, so it's already doing that, but it's, it's just not enough. And also, um, the, the support to reduce carbon emission is still not there. I think this is a COP. I think uh, the message from this COP is clear. And I'm so happy that this year's COP has very strong food system agriculture presence. And I hope in the future this will continue. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Professor Fan, very much. Thank you all for the... Uh, let's give a round of applause for the excellent speeches and discussions uh, from the panelists. And th great thanks to the audience. So our, our event is, uh, is done, and thank you all very much. Thank you.